is our quarterly briefing for Q3. And as always, we have the same crew that we've had for a while here. Myself, Drew, Benito, Chris Beach, and Christian Murphy. I think Chris Beach might be the only one who's not presenting today. So you won't hear from him, but um, you'll hear from everybody else. All right, so the agenda, um, we're going to start off with uPortal Community News. Um, we're going to go into discussion around web component updates and new portal designs. And then we're going to have our community spotlight. FH uh, Foothills De Anza is going to be showing us their portlet free portal. And we'll talk about 5.3.0 being released. And then our sustaining engineering update. And then at the end, we'll uh, cover any questions and answers we might have. We, we do have kind of a, quite a few agenda items, <laughs> so um, we're going to work to make sure we finish on time. But we will be time checking if we start running late anywhere. All right, so let's go ahead and kick us off. I believe Benito might be kicking us off with uPortal Community News. I think that's me, actually. This oh, is, is that you, Drew? Okay. Yeah, you bet. Uh, yeah, hey, this is Drew Wills. Allie, if you could go to the next slide. Uh, first piece of community news, uh, last month on September 19th, there was a uh, community call, uh, sorry, there was an Aperio-sponsored uh, webinar for uPortal, part of the, the fall Aperio webinar series. Uh, and uh, the uPortal community um, and the uPortal steering committee offered uh, one of those Aperio webinars, and it was this, uh, Form Builder for uPortal, uh, sort of a, a deep dive into uh, building content based on, uh, on web components and microservices, specifically uh, the, the new Form Builder and FBMS uh, components for uPortal. Uh, these are exciting. Uh, they bring uh, the ability to, to to add arbitrary web forms to your portal uh, based on a, a technology called JSON schema. These, these components, Form Builder and FBMS, Form Builder is the front end, FBMS is the back end. These components are very near to, be, to being um, added by default, bundled by default in your portal start. Uh, there was a one-hour webinar. Actually, it, it ended up being more like an hour and a half uh, webinar, but it was recorded and published on the Aperio Foundation YouTube channel. Uh, I have the URL there, but I don't really expect that anyone is going to write that down and type it. Uh, I would um, search for the Aperio Foundation uh, YouTube channel. There's a lot of stuff there, and this uh, recording is available there. Uh, all right, next slide. Uh, another thing that we definitely need to cover in the community news, uh, a reminder that the second annual uPortal Winter Summit uh, will be held in Gilbert, Arizona at the Unicon headquarters this time. Last year it was at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, but Unicon headquarters, uh, Gilbert, Arizona, uh, temperatures will likely be good. We, we held an, an Aperio event um, several years ago once where uh, we experienced some of the coldest temperatures I ever remember uh, living in Arizona, and it was uh, ironic and humorous to everyone. Uh, but that will most likely not be the case. Uh, we will enjoy um, excellent temperatures uh, in January, last week in January. Uh, this is a this is a free event. There is no registration cost, uh, no cost to attend, other than you know travel, uh, hotel, um, you know sort of the cost associated with eating. Uh, please consider joining us. Last year's event was uh, a tremendous success. I think everyone got a lot out of it. We had uh, I think eight or so institutions participating. Uh, we expect a similar, uh, you know, turnout this time around. Uh, I'll be delighted if we can do better than that. You know, we're shooting for more than eight, maybe. Uh, next slide. Uh, there is there is a collaborative planning document in Google Docs, uh, and the URL for it is being widely circulated on 
the uPortal user list. Uh, I didn't put the URL in here because just like the last one, it would be very difficult to write down uh, and, and type in. So I'll encourage you to uh, find it on the uPortal user list. Uh, it's been shared uh, a number of times. But in this collaborative planning document, you can find out more information about what will happen. Uh, you can put in the things that you would like to happen. You can share your uh, intent to participate, uh, which would be great. You can learn about some of the lodging options and evening options and so forth, uh, all in this document. Uh, last thing about the Winter Summit, uh, there will be uh, a, a free sort of half-day uh, workshop training session on uPortal front-end development with uh, web components and, and node-based technologies uh, will be offered probably on the first day. Uh, so, you know, perhaps that is as good a reason as any uh, to come and attend. Uh, perhaps that helps, uh, you know, the free training offering helps justify, uh, you know, the cost and the effort to attend at your organization. Uh, we hope so. Anyway, uh, next slide. Last item of community news. Uh, we now have a date and a venue uh, for the next Open Imperio, Open Imperio 2019. Uh, I, you know, I can see who's on this call, and I know that many of you have attended uh, Open Imperio in the past. Uh, any of you who have know that ordinarily uh, it is a, uh, a great event for you, Portal. Uh, Open Imperio is typically very well attended by the uPortal community. Uh, it typically offers a, a, a packed schedule of content for uPortal. Uh, you know, some great presentations. Uh, is, and even more than that, um, the uPortal community, the uPortal steering committee typically offers, organizes uh, sort of extra content or extra you know, planning sessions uh, around you portal at Open Aperio. Uh, attending Open Aperio for your institution is a very excellent way uh, to have the, you know, sort of the perspective and the needs of your organization represented in the, uh, in the thinking, the, the planning and prioritizing uh, for the coming year in sort of the uPortal community and the development, uh, ongoing development of uPortal. It's not the only way, but it is one important way because we, uh, we get together and we put our heads together at this event every year. And so I encourage you to attend uh, in, you know, with every possible form of emphasis. All right, uh, next slide. I think that's all from me. I think it's Christian Murphy. Thanks, Drew. Um, so with this, um, the new designs in uPortal, there are two um, new web components that I want to highlight, um, or rather component categories. One of them is the um, ESCO content grid, which we'll go into a little bit more in just a moment. The other is we now have a full bundle of notification components, um, including a modal for high priority alerts, a banner that can show at the top of the page, similar to the tips that we currently have in new portal, and the notification um, icon, which you can click on, and it'll give you a highlight of some of the notifications. Um, and more of these, um, day by day, are getting embedded directly into new portal and the new portal start. Um, so absolutely check them out. Um, but the exciting thing that we have going on right now is the ESCO content grid, um, being contributed by Git Brescia in France. It is a combination of, I believe, seven different components. Um, so here you're seeing all of those components put together. Um, it is broken into the kind of um, left part, um, top corner, that is a user badge. Next to it, there's a scrollable favorites content. And then below it, um, there is a whole list of all of the different services within the portal with the full tech search to be able to track down on um, specific items. Uh, and what's really nice about this is it's fully broken down into seven components. So if you just want to use, for example, the icons for the, uh, 
individual portlets that can be used. If you just want to use the favorites functionality, that can be used, just the grid, that can be used, just the icon. Um, it's fully reusable in any way that you want to mix and match that experience. Um, and best of all, it looks pretty good, which is a really nice thing to have in new portal. Uh, um, so these are kind of building up towards um, new, more dynamic experiences that people can create. Um, we've already had some schools like State Center, um, Cuesta, and Cal Poly Pomona starting to adopt bits and pieces of this. Um, but now I'd like to hand off to um, Matt from Foothill Bianza um, and have him introduce kind of the new portal experience that they're building. Uh, thank you, Christian. Uh, how's my audio? Can everyone hear me? Sounded good. Okay, very good. All right, uh, next slide, if you would, please. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Matt Rapchinski. I'm a project manager at uh, the Foothill De Anza Community College District. Just a little bit about um, our district and our institutions. Uh, we are in California, in the United States, and uh, we're part of the Triple C system in California, which is uh, 114 um, different campuses in the state of two-year colleges. And uh, we are a district of two colleges, as you see in the logos. We have Foothill and Los Altos Hills, which is here in the Bay Area uh, near San Francisco, and uh, De Anza, which is just a little bit further south in Cupertino. Um, we have, on average, 31,000 students uh, in a quarter system. So we have four periods of registration um, each year and a staff count of about 2,000. So, you know, we may be medium size in the triple C system, not the smallest and, and certainly not the largest. And uh, we're also a banner school, which if you're unfamiliar with that, um, uh, Lucian Banner is an ERP product. It's uh, similar to uh, PeopleSoft or MS Dynamics for running a business. And um, so all of our student data and finance and employment um, is managed through that system. And, and you'll see that that serves a vital um, source of data for uh, our portal. So uh, next slide, please. So um, we have had portals at our institution for a really long time and they predate my arrival and I've been uh, employed here now for about 10 years but when we became a, a banner school um, we implemented something called a luminous platform 4 um, from Lucian or then SunGuard and uh, so the screenshots of that implementation are what you see now this for us was the first time that we ever had a portal um, that targeted all of our constituents, that we had, we had a place with something for everyone. Um, Luminous 4 was based on uPortal 2 dot something, a very old version, um, but they also took uPortal and then layered on tons of vendor-specific enhancements, things that were not um, part of the community, like announcements and group studio, um, course studio, all of this proprietary stuff. And um, it came out of box really insisting that you use the tab layout, which you also see in these screenshots. And you know, it's true if you're familiar with Luminous 4, you could probably hack it and, and rip apart the style sheets and not have that. But you know, for us, we accepted the default. The risk of modifying Luminous wasn't worth it. And also Luminous, by the time we finished with it, it really barely supported portlets. So we've had a, a really bad experience with that over the years. But uh, our users really had two big beefs with this design, and that is the tabs themselves are part of the problem. Um, as you can see in the screenshots that I have here, um, really overgrown. In fact, that these aren't even all of the tabs that are visible, um, you know, even though I was a portal admin. But the users came to us and said, you know, it's hard to find stuff. They're having to dig through these screens like a file cabinet. And uh, the other issue is that we, you know, by our own fault, really made the portal just a link bay. You know, we didn't have dynamic feeds of data or useful representations of things right in the portal. We ended up needing to sift through the tabs, find the link you're looking for, click it, open another tab to go and, and get data from some relevant external system. So all of that combined together, along with no single sign-on, it, uh, it was time for us to do something different. Another beef we had with Luminous is that it really did a terrible job with portlets in terms of the implementation. We had issues such as um, launching a new portlet would crash, you know, one of the portlet workers or the portal workers where it got launched on. 
or you know maybe we didn't crash the portal that day but you know the new portlet was unreachable until uh, we re restarted the web tiers so just really a lot of problems and and for us once we started looking at a new portal we actually thought about you know do we even need portlets like, is this a really fundamental um, part of the experience that we need to continue having and uh, so as you're going to see we decided to dump portlets and uh, so I think our you know as we go on here you can see the design came out rather nice uh, next slide please so this was an early prototype um, this is not what the final product looks like but we, you know we spent probably close to you know eight to nine months um, just having meetings and just taking a design and going on a road show to both of the colleges, meeting with faculty, meeting with the executives, um, meeting with some of the student trustees and trying to figure out, you know, if we redesign this thing, what are people looking for? Um, how do we eliminate their complaints and so on? And uh, so we came out with what you see here, which is, you know, an elimination of the tabs and you know, a lot of influencers here at the college have really liked Microsoft's design language where you see, you know, the tiles and strong iconography and, you know, bright colors that distinguish things. And so this was, you know, kind of what we came up with with a driving result. And from this design, then we informed, you know, okay, so we looked at major portals like uPortal and um, what's the other big one that Luminous 5 is based on? I forget it at the moment. Uh, LifeRay and, and a couple others. And we figured out that uPortal, uh, you know, met the needs to implement this design and, uh, and not really add a lot of overhead or headaches to the process. Uh, next slide, please. Another issue we wanted to address was um, responsive design. So this is part of our prototyping process that we committed to the colleges that we were going to come up with a design that worked on a narrow screen as well as it worked on a desktop screen. And an issue with Luminous 4, why we couldn't do that, is that the old tab layout, um, frankly, predated the idea of responsive design and uh, media tags and so on and, and whatnot. The layout was a mashup of tons of tables and nested tables and tables nested in more tables. And so what a student had to do was pinch and zoom on their device to get around. And, uh, so we were determined to get rid of that. All right, so next slide, please. All right, so this is a, a video demo. Just just narrate over. Um, kind of concluded working with uh, you know Drew and Christian Benito that just seeing what the portal looks like may be more interesting than slides. So go ahead and play that. So our final design um, takes a Bootstrap 4 for the CSS, and we left all of the defaults, including Flexbox, and uh, we glued the whole thing together using React. And so as you see, the screens are changing. We're not redrawing the portal layout. The portal is delivered to a user as a single page app. And so after the portal authenticates, this view loads exactly once from the server. And what we do to keep load times reasonable and to have all this content is uh, doing cool things like uh, dynamic code splitting with Webpack. And it allows us to just keep shoving stuff into the portal, content and apps and, and things of that nature, and not grow um, the core load time. But uh, a consequence of this, if you want to call it that, is with this new design and being free of portlets, um, we do not use Responder. It, it got sidelined. And so this is a, a, you know, a completely different way to work with uPortal. And um, it is true that we're um, probably getting rid of some of the tradition that has made uPortal really good and, and um, heading in a different direction. So what happens now is uPortal um, does all of the back office work. We depend on it for single sign-on. We definitely depend on attribute resolution, group calculations, and all of this gets handed off to the front end um, with the APIs. In fact, the, the most important API that we use um, with uPortal 5.1 is the open ID tokens that get generated. And all of our APIs and data feeds consume that token to know who the user is and that they are authenticated. We did a couple other things also that break with tradition. Um, we do not use the DLM at the present to decide what content objects are delivered to the user. Um, we developed a much smaller, more compact engine called uh, Config Graph. It's schemaless, does not use a backing database, does not have a strict data format. It's something that runs really nicely in an AWS Lambda, which you'll see in a little while. And uh, so there are 
there were a couple of needs to break with tradition because we wanted to try some new things in the portal that um, you, Portal Core, did not do yet. Um, having that new content engine um, drive search, and especially having search that's authenticated, uh, which the current REST API does not do. And so before we wanted to get carrying away with um, hacking you portal, we wanted just to prototype stuff. We wanted just to see it work and uh, know if any of these ideas and concepts that we wanted to try could actually function properly. So now we can see that they do because we're in production and I, you know, we want to make an effort in the future to contribute some of this stuff um, to the core if necessary. So that's uh, the design in a nutshell. Uh, next slide, please. The other thing that we did with our portal is, um, as an institution strategy, is go to the cloud. We're just you know, sick and tired of hosting stuff ourselves. Um, our VMware experience has been suboptimal. And uh, so we selected um, AWS as our provider. Um, we also have a second managed service contract with them for the banner side of things. That's managed by Lucian. So for absence of doubt, we are an AWS school through and through and, and have no intention at this time of doing hybrid cloud with Azure or any of those other groups. The other thing that was important when selecting a new portal was, can it work in a container? We already came into this process having experience with Docker and Tomcat. Um, and so that was a requirement to be able to containerize the portal product that we deploy. So we, uh, you know, when we did our first training with Drew, um, over a year ago, when he came on site, we actually containerized uPortal 5 right there, even uh, months before the official Docker files were released for uPortal start. So I'll walk you through the diagram of what we've done. Uh, so everything there starts on the left with uh, uh, CloudFront, which is Amazon's uh, CDN for uh, distributing content. But it's not just a CDN, it's also a programmable uh, CDN using uh, Lambda functions. So as you can see, the different colors and lines break out based on the path being requested. Um, so when a user requests something from the portal itself, then it goes through a traditional set of load balancers through VMs and then two uPortal Tomcat containers running in production. And then those connect to the backend services like Active Directory and Banner and, and so forth, which is an Oracle database. The uh, red route you see there, slash API, that's really the um, core part of dumping portlets. And uh, so any requests going through that route get sent through an API gateway, which consumes the portal open ID uh, uh, token and authenticates the request and then passes it back to a Lambda, which we write our Lambdas in Node.js 8 at the moment. And so this uh, combined with the React is how we go portlet free. These APIs do all kinds of things, talking to backend systems and they return JSON data. And then React consumes that JSON data and renders the markup. Um, so for an example, you know, we have an API that goes to Banner and uh, pulls a course schedule for a student, pulls the section detail, it pulls the schedule of that course. If it has multiple meetings, it'll mash that up with data from their online learning environment in Canvas, if that one exists. And then that gets fed into the home view um, when the portal renders after the first login. And then lastly, at the bottom there, you see that we use S3. And so because we're using React, we also use Webpack as a, a build tool. So all the JavaScript and CSS and the static images, we just throw that into an S3 bucket and uh, attach different caching policies to that so that uh, you know, when clients visit the portal or users visit the portal, that they don't need to redownload uh, re image content and so things over and over again. Uh, we load tested this design in uh, this last summer in July, and um, uh, you know to borrow a word from Drew, it really screams, and the performance is just outstanding. And partially because we're riding on Amazon's uh, global infrastructure, but we we actually found that as far as the portal itself is concerned, the big bottleneck is Active Directory. Like the portal performance is fantastic; it did not break a sweat but the partner systems that we depend on uh, ended up posing the problem. So we've been very pleased with performance and um, we had a, a flawless launch uh, last month into production. It's almost, uh, you know, probably 45 days that this design has been live and uh, very, very happy with it. So that is our uh, uPortal 5 implementation in a nutshell and uh, free of portlets at last. And um, so there we go, I'll turn it back over to you, Allison. All right, great, thanks so much, Matt. 
Hey, um, Cliff, uh, there was a question in the chat uh, about the version of Java. I thought I'd let Matt take it. Oh, yeah. Let me see, Bruce. What version of Java is your portal back in? Uh, Bruce, it's Java 8. Um, you know, whatever, you know, whatever recent version of the JDK is, it's, you know, one of those uh, builds in the 100s. Pretty standard stuff. Definitely not using Java 9, as we know that doesn't work at the plant at the moment. What is your plan to get Java 11? Um, we'll do it when uPortal supports it. All right. I don't know if it's worth pointing out that, um, you know, because we containerize uPortal, I mean, upgrading JDKs is, um, you know, as a matter of changing a base image and then moving on. So um, we're, we're well equipped to change JDKs when uh, the time is right. So we have a new minor release for uPortal, uPortal 5.3. Uh, those of you, you know, sort of following along in this process, I think will have realized by now that when in the, in the era of uPortal 5, when the minor uh, version increments, when we have a new minor version, uh, the amount of effort uh, it takes an existing uPortal 5 uh, adoption to move on to a new minor version is very small. Uh, so as you see these minor versions go up uh, every few months, uh, you, you know, the current pace is about three new minor versions a year. Uh, you know, don't, don't fret about that. Don't worry about it. it uh, is, it, it's a relatively minor task uh, to move up in minor version. It is uh, less effort uh, than uh, moving uh, a patch version in the uPortal 3 era was, I would say, and possibly the uPortal 4. Uh, anyway, uh, go ahead, next slide. Uh, the, I really, I only have one slide about uPortal 5.3. Uh, uh, there's not a whole lot to say. There's more information in the main release notes for it, which are visible, you know, viewable on, on GitHub in the, in the normal place. Uh, but I'll highlight uh, just a few new future uh, features. Uh, we did a lot of work on uh, on polyfills on JavaScript libraries, uh, updating them uh, for uPortal 5.3. Uh, we have a lot of content now and planning a lot more content based on on web components and more sophisticated JavaScript. So we one of the things we did with 5.3 is we worked out better. We worked out you know, a more sort of concrete set of rules about what level of JavaScript API support the components can expect and what, uh, you know, sort of what API support they need to bring with them uh, if they use it. And so the, the goal of uPortal 5.3 and beyond is to support ES6 out of the box. Uh, you know, Christian can maybe comment in the chat. My understanding is that ES6 is state-of-the-art JavaScript circa maybe 2015. Uh, so, and, you know, the, the leading browsers, uh, you know, Chrome, Firefox, uh, they really, the ones that are updated aggressively, they support ES6 out of the box. Uh, some browsers that are uh, updated less aggressively do not, uh, do not fully support ES6. And so the polyfills that we are including with you portal out of the box are designed uh, to bring those browsers up to compliance with this standard. In uPortal 5.3, we remove the concept of a template user. Uh, those of you who, who have been with us for a long time, some of the folks at at Kansas and, and folks at Unicon and so forth will remember, you know, that uPortal, in, in the early days of uPortal 2, uh, uPortal relied on this notion of template users in order to give uh, content and group affiliations to new people who logged into the portal. Uh, we have not used the temp we have not heavily used uh, the template user system. We haven't relied on it. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have advocated against using it for more than 10 years. Uh, you know, it's been de uh, deprecated capabilities. So in uPortal 5.3, we finally got around to removing it. Uh, in the uPortal 5 era, incrementally as we go forward in the uPortal 5 era, we have, we're, we're making an effort, we're trying 
uh, to remove some of the bloat, uh, some of the excess, you know, code and, and, and functions and classes and modules and so forth that, that are not really a part of the, um, uh, you know, the portal solution that we expect people to use and, and base the portals on. Uh, because the uPortal code base is tremendous and it is more difficult to maintain because of its size. Uh, so where we can identify things that, you know, that we don't really rely on and, and have advocated against for a long time, we're trying to remove them. Uh, let's see, there was a new feature contribution. This is from across the pond in, in France, the ASIP uh, community members contributed the ability to run uPortal using multiple CAS instances. Uh, there is some configuration for that that is not enabled by default, but is there. Uh, BYU, and I see Lauren on the call, added a health check uh, endpoint, um, you know, API endpoint to uPortal to facilitate uh, running primarily uh, to facilitate running a portal in the cloud because a lot of cloud services and container uh, platforms, you know, want you to have this health check capability. Uh, the with five three there are, you know, un unfortunately it's not terrible, but there are a couple of required uh, data changes. Uh, you know, 5.3 versus pre-5.3, uh, there are some changes to the data uh, that you will need. Uh, they mostly, mostly relate to removing template users. If you already have a database, uh, you know, an existing portal database only needs one data change, and that is that you have to import the system. Level. That's that second board, uh, bullet point. But if you have if you have a uPortal start and you use that uPortal start to portal in it or data in it to, to reinitialize the database, uh, you know, the way I do in a development environment, uh, there are two data changes. You have to remove, you have to add the system layout just like for uh, an existing database. And furthermore, you have to remove all of the default template user files. Uh, there are uh, layout files, profile files, uh, from your data set because uh, they will not import because the the default template user user file will be ignored by uPortal 5.3 and beyond. Uh, last point on the slide and then I'm going to uh, get caught up with the chat. Uh, be sure to use the 5.3.1 build, not the 5.3.0. Uh, immediately after releasing the 5.3.0, we discovered that we had introduced uh, some snafus in the authentication process, a couple of them. Uh, you know, they mostly have workarounds in configuration, uh, but it's just a lot easier to use the 531 build where we corrected those. All right, so I am going to get caught up with chat, uh, open JDK, all right. Um, let's see. Yes, uh, there is work on, uh, you know, Java beyond Java 8. Uh, you know, I imagine, my sense is that in the next couple of months, that's going to become a lot more important, and as it does, it will become a bigger focus of what we're doing day to day. Let's see. It looks like most of the chat is related to that. Are there any... Um, any questions, you know, before we move on, on the uPortal 5.3 uh, release? I'm happy to take them. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there aren't. It's not, it's not a tremendously complicated update. Uh, all of this information and more, including detailed information about the required data changes, are in the release notes uh, in the standard place in GitHub. All right, excellent. Uh, I think I can hand it over to, I, I think it was Benito for uh, the final section. Hey, good morning, folks. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hello? All right, excellent. So I'll cover sustained engineering update. Uh, next slide. 
So just a quick summary. Uh, in Q3, we had six uPorter releases, including two minor releases. We went from 4.1 to 5.3. Uh, there are, were about a dozen projects that were updated in the uPortal space. Um, you know, the popular portlets, of course, uPortal Start as well, uh, and then some minor things along with some web components. Uh, we spent over 300 hours. A lot of that was just our standard uh, effort to keep things moving and improving, fixing bugs as, as we can, and uh, quite a bit of web component work, in particular polishing things up. This is a new technology. Uh, there, there are a lot of people adopting it out there, uh, internet developers, um, but there's still some rough corners, especially with browsers and in particular older browsers. Uh, next slide. So again, with uPortal, there were several releases. Uh, 512 is where we started Q3. We ended up with 530. It just barely made it. Um, and then 531 was cut released, or it was cut recently. As uh, so there was lots of updates to the web components. Um, those are just uh, going quickly. Um, there's lots of updates, just refinements and improvements. Uh, only one release for calendar portlet, just bringing it up, updating to for Oracle. Um, notifications portlet had some uh, major releases, jumped a, a minor revision, and again, news reader and announcements as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the one thing to, to highlight along with the template user um, is that there was a, a breaking change with the OIDC token for custom claims. If you're using that, not a lot of people are right now. This is uh, one of the newer features that supports web components. But in, in, in a very small case, if you're using custom claims, check out the uh, release notes to see uh, what has changed there for the OIDC token. Uh, with Oracle, we did kind of fall off our support. Uh, there's a bit of a challenge getting that into a test environment uh, and working. We've kind of circumvented that um, thanks to Docker and being able to spin something up um, directly from Oracle with regards to their database, test things out, and, and now I think all our um, current uPortal versions uh, and, and related projects support it again. Um, and then uh, the ferreted flag was added to the portlet registry. So those are just some highlights that uh, the improvements we've seen between 5.1 and 5.3. Next slide. Uh, and just to highlight again, uh, bye bye template user, uh, getting rid of this old old uh, feature set, uh, improving things in, in, a, in a large way for uPortal. Some of the technologies we have in uPortal, very old, and the more we remove, the easier it is to, to freshen it, upgrade, and, and um, keep things improving. Uh, it's little pieces, not, not in particular template user, but other pieces where the technology is kind of old and implementations don't support the latest versions of Spring and Hibernate, which are two key libraries that we use for uPortal. Uh, there, there's things like that that kind of slow us down when it comes to upgrading to um, the latest versions of Spring and Hibernate. Next slide. Uh, and so what are we going to do in Q4? Again, as subscribers, you can submit Zendesk tickets to put things uh, on our list. Uh, there'll be more web components and certainly more work on web components. Uh, we're kind of excited there uh, just to, to mention that Firefox this week is supposed to release a new version that has better support for web components. We've seen some performance issues with that particular browser. Um, so now with, with real support for the technologies behind web components, we should see a much better experience with that particular browser. Um, again, we'll fo focus on cross-browser compatibility. Uh, really want to um, look at moving the community uh, to using the latest versions of browsers, getting their communities and constituents uh, to look at upgrading uh, as soon as possible. Uh, in particular, IE11 is something we're really looking forward to dropping uh, support for. Uh, that's something that we're going to now want uh, to look at um, carefully uh, as we do work moving forward um, to call out whether it's really needed because there's a lot of effort to keep IE11 working, especially since Edge is widely available. Um, people should be 
uh, Windows users should be using Windows 10. Uh, also in Q4, we're looking at um, events cleanup, doing some work there. Um, also calendar admin process corrections. If you've dealt with the calendar admin, you know that uh, through the UI, you cannot uh, add a, a global calendar feed. Um, it looks like the pages are there and, and the UI is there to do that, but it just doesn't quite work. So um, BYU has done a lot of work there. Thanks, Lauren. Um, so hopefully we can carry that across the finish line here in Q4. And then of course, just general improvements. Uh, but again, if you're a subscriber and you want to add something to our, our list, um, and I have a few that, that aren't on this list, we certainly have a backlog, but go ahead and open a Zendesk ticket. Um, let us know what you want us to work on with uh, sustaining engineering. Next slide. And that's it for me. Any questions? So we actually have uh, 15 minutes, which is uh, maybe 15 more than I expected based on the amount of content that we had. Uh, so there must be someone with a question. I can usually rely on Aaron Grant. Absolutely, this, uh, the recording of this session will be available. Um, Ali uh, mentioned a bit about that when we got started, but it will be on the Unicon uh, YouTube channel where recordings from previous sessions are you know, already available. So uh, let me take the question from Bruce about uh, non-portlet content. Uh, there really are two options uh, at this point, and maybe that and maybe that does count as several. Uh, there is there's one option in U Portal Five that is a purely you know that is a back end solution for non portlet content back end approach, and one uh, that is a, a purely front end uh, approach to uh, non portlet content. Uh, the first approach that we introduce, which is the the back end approach, uh, is you know soffits or sort of the original vision of soffits, uh, and th and that included sort of the full vision of soffits uh, in includes uh, in U Portal Five includes a capability to uh, develop markup for the browser that is rendered server side typically with uh, a JSP. Uh, and, in the, and in that respect, this, you know, the full soffit uh, approach is a non-portlet, uh, you know, content development strategy that looks much more like uh, portlet development than uh, the other one. Originally with uPortal 5, uh, it was felt, you know, certainly by me and I think by others, uh, some of them, uh, that we could not uh, avoid, um, I'm not even sure if I should phrase it that way. I, you know, originally I don't think we were looking, all of us were not looking uh, beyond the idea that markup would be rendered server-side somehow. Uh, we, uh, at the time, certainly I did, felt that that, that capability was unavoidable uh, uh, and completely desired. Uh, and so the full, uh, you know, spectrum of things that soffits can do includes the ability to render a JSP server side. Uh, but with web components, we really are able to avoid that altogether. Uh, the web component-based content that we uh, have been working on more recently, we've favored it heavily. Uh, the web component based content actually uses the other parts of soffits, uh, like the ID token uh, rest endpoint and some of the security, uh, you know, some of the extensions for spring security. Uh, the web component based content is, uh, the web components themselves are completely static, entirely front end. Uh, so those two strategies exist. At Unicon, once, once both these options became completely visible to us, we uh, pretty quickly uh, decided to favor the web component strategy. Uh, the web component development strategy for content in the portal aligns extremely nicely with what, uh, you know, for lack of a better way to put it, um, uPortal outsiders, you know, people who weren't 
dyed in the wool you portal adopters and developers uh you know folks you know looking from the outside in or just joining the community uh, web components aligns extremely nicely with what they were asking us for which is uh, a, a much more contemporary uh, approach to developing content uh, for uPortal. Let's see. Uh, so Tobin asks about switching between uh, sort of the foothill front end and the um, responder-based front end and um, uPortal home and so forth. Uh, I, I would argue, I would say that it is, uh, it's already extremely easy to switch to uh, uPortal Home for your front end. Uh, the problem is that the current, um, you know, releases, the current builds of uPortal Home that we have don't work with uh, the current builds, uh, the current public builds of uPortal that we have. The Wisconsin have customizations uh, to the uPortal, you know, sort of core uPortal framework that are not included in the public uPortal builds. Uh, and so many of the features or some of the best features of uPortal Home uh, are not available unless you introduce those customizations or unless uh, somehow together we work on enhancing uPortal Home uh, to work better with the public builds of uPortal. Uh, Matt, had, you know, just today and before today, talked about potentially uh, making more of the work that he's done available publicly. Uh, perhaps we could use uh, Matt's front end uh, in, um, you know, as an alternative, uh, you know, front end for uPortal. Uh, the University of Edinburgh have a very similar, um, it's not similar in the in the user experience, it's similar in the t in the way uh, it functions. Uh, alternative front end, and perhaps uh, the, perhaps at some point they will make that available. Uh, I also think that a reboot of Responder that is not based on XSL and is instead a single uh, page app is coming. Uh, probably not this month or next month, but I think that. A reboot of Responder uh, that is, you know, more similar to what you see at Foothill, uh, to what you see at Wisconsin, at least in the technologies, uh, you know, approach to the front end, more similar to Foothill uh, that is coming. Hey, Drew, it's Matt. If, could I jump in? Um, yeah, of course. Uh, you know what? Uh, so to uh, to just follow up on Tobin's question too. So I use uPortal Start. That's where Unicon started us. And um, so my UI does not modify uPortal Start. Actually, it's it's just slots right in there. But the secret sauce um, is Webpack. Um, you know, because I I'm not particularly opinionated about you know React versus Vue versus Angular. I mean, I don't like Angular. It's the only thing I'll say about that. But you know, that's not that's just you know my particular choice. You choose whatever you like. But Webpack as a tool and as a build process is what drives our entire thing. And so there's nothing included in uPortal Start or uPortal Anything that shows an institution or implementer how to do that. So that would be my feedback, at least one piece of feedback to send upstream into the community is to do a non-portlet project, you know, there needs to be some recommendation of a standard build tool and at least where to start. I mean, I don't know if you or Christian have any kind of follow-up thoughts to that. Christian, uh, you know, I don't know if you want to jump in there. Uh, I was, Matt, uh, I'm always delighted to offer follow-up thoughts, but specifically to which part, uh, the Webpack? Yeah, I, I mean, um, you, you know, it, there needs to be, a, you know, uPortal Start provides a great starting place to do the server side, mm -hmm. but, you know, beyond that, then we just developed our own front end and whatnot. I think if another institution wanted to jump in there, there needs to be some kind of like, you know, place to start, you know, and then they can glue on what they want to work on. And yeah. I, uh, so uh, Bruce at Kansas is asking questions that, um, that to me make it sound like Foothill is, uh, is introducing some new kind of uh, content for uPortal. And I don't really see it that way. Foothill has an alternative front end, 
exactly. I would agree as well. Yeah, but but they're not introducing uh, they're not introducing a new form of pluggable content. Mm -hmm. They actually use the uPortal uh, content metadata records in the same way that all of the front ends for uPortal use them uh, as JSON. So Matt, jumping back to what you were asking before about kind of a shared building point for front ends. Um, I do think that Webpack could be a good option. Um, the challenge I would see is that a lot of different institutions are adopting different frameworks, mm -hmm. and those frameworks don't necessarily always play well together out of the box, and that's where I kind of see the, the web component paradigm stepping in of if you can build any piece of content in Vue and React and Preact and whatever new exciting shiny framework comes out tomorrow, um, and export it as a web component, you can include it in uPortal and it'll just work. And that's kind of a, the direction that I see uPortal increasingly taking um, because it gives a lot more flexibility and freedom for people to make um, different technology choices while, not, um, while it's still working in uPortal well. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and like Drew just said in the chat, like front-end platform agnostic. But you know, so I get, maybe it's the replacement to responder or the upgrade to responder that is the, the, the jump off point. Because um, right now, you know, I can't give my UI to somebody else. I mean, I guess I could give you the source code. I wouldn't care about that. But, you know, no one's going to know how to use it or implement it. That's the thing. So how would another college come in or another, instant, another implementer come in and, and do that, do what we did? There's no blueprint for it right now. So one thing that might be worth taking a look at is I know in uPortal Start there is a work in progress branch that enables um, the core UI to be swapped out for uPortal Home, UW's front end. Mm -hmm. um, potentially that could be generalized a bit more so that it could be used to swap in um, the Foothill Deanza front end, the Edinburgh front end, um, the new exciting school front end. Um, also, I just see in the chat uh, Tobin's comment about a, a U portal that's strict APIs. Man, I'm I'm with that one too. That, you know, plus one. You have to give them some front end, but the front end doesn't have to come from U portal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I on purpose I phrased that in a kind of odd way. Uh, the front end does not have to come from. I'm, I mostly mean that the front end does not have to come from the U portal web app. It doesn't have to come from the same Java process that runs the REST APIs. That's correct. Yeah. Like the uPortal specific uh, REST APIs. Uh, most of the front ends, uh, this was in Matt's diagram, but most of the um, alternative front ends that are being built today uh, could very easily and elegantly uh, be um, served from like static, you know, Amazon S3. Yeah, I mean, I think for absence of doubt, just to follow up on, on my diagram, yeah, so the UI that we built does not get served out of uPortal at all. So with that in mind, you can build whatever you want and hook it on there. And, um, you know, we chose to do ours a certain way, but there's lots and lots of options, as Christian pointed out. Um, so, yeah, there you go. You know, maybe just don't hook it into uPortal uh, in terms of the HTML rendering if you want to try something new. So uh, let me jump back in here. I think there's actually, I, I think we're dancing around a sort of a very important point here that I, I think needs to be brought to the surface so that people are clear. Um, you are, uh, what you're witnessing and what we're talking about here, um, there are a number of uPortal adopting institutions that are making a choice uh, to develop a, a you know, uh, to develop a new software component, to develop a completely custom front end for uPortal, because that's a match for their ambitions and capabilities. Uh, it's it's a match for their uh, you know priorities and um, uh, you know sort of value judgments about how um, uh, you know web applications should be built and so forth. Uh, and and that is great. Uh, we absolutely want to uh, facilitate that. There's a tremendous amount of innovation and new ideas and energy uh, going into these front ends. But that choice, you know, that sort of fundamental decision to build something new and custom is, at the end of the day, that's going to be a minority decision. 
in the uPortal community. Uh, there will be, uh, I'd say, four or five uPortal adopting institutions that will not choose to build their own front end for every one that does, you know, at least four or five. Uh, and those, uh, you know, that don't choose to do that still have an exciting future with uPortal. Right now we have uh, res a responder front end, which is pretty good. Uh, it is still based on XSL, but it is, uh, it's based on XSL that you don't need to customize locally in order to succeed. Uh, we also have a number of alternative front ends emerging in the community, and those, you know, some of those are already available, and more of those may be available over time. So even if you don't want to build, uh, you know, one of these, you know, completely modern single page app front ends, you may be able to adopt one that someone else builds. Uh, lastly, uh, as I said just a few minutes ago, I think it's, it's, I think it's virtually certain that the responder, that the responder front end that we have will be rebooted as a single page app. So we will have a version of responder probably in 2019, perhaps even the first half of 2019, uh, that is uh, static, not based on XSL, not based on server-side rendering, uh, that, that will nevertheless support uh, regions uh, and will work very similarly to the existing responder uh, in which you can put uh, web component-based content and probably even portlet-based content. Yeah, I'd like just like to mention that you know uPortal is now becoming um, more and more like a collection of backend services. So, you know, in in Foothill DeAnza's case, we're looking at not using Responder to get a layout, but in the other front ends, they're still leveraging uh, an API call at the layout in, in JSON format, and then presenting the user content based on that. So, uh, you know, th this is a step away from that, uh, but still there's, uh, as Matt mentioned, there's services from that uPortal provides that are being leveraged, like, um, you know, the tokens to secure the APIs. So it's a matter of just to mix your, your current skill set, how much you want to invest in the portal, what look you're trying to get. And while we focus on technology, you know, we really want to look at what are your resources available uh, to build out a, a portal that meets your community's needs. Um, so while there's all this uh, excitement about web components and new front-end alternatives, you can still produce a, a very nice uh, portal out of the box with what's there, um, not adopting all the latest technologies. But if you want to go in and modify things, if you want to improve or create custom web components, you can do that with portlets all the way up to uh, not using new portal for any front end uh, technology. And that's all I have to say about that. We're a few minutes over. Yes, yeah, thanks Benito. I was actually just getting ready to say that, that we're a couple minutes over, so um, We'll probably try to wrap up any uh, last questions, and then um, we'll call it a meeting. I think we got to all the questions in the chat, from what I can see. And Drew, just so you know, I did mute you because your typing uh, was a little loud. <laughs> so okay. if you're trying to talk, I muted you. <laughs> yeah, I thought about that, but I was already typing. Yeah, no worries. So that was wise of you. I, I just, like the topic that we we're most recently talking about, the one that, um, you know, where Bruce, Bruce has added a number of uh, uh, sort of incremental questions. Uh, I, I think, I think we kind of need to be clear, uh, you know, as we are adopting more and more JavaScript and sort of modern sort of node-based front-end development, um, you know, techniques, I, I really want to point out that really no one is asking us, you know, no one is coming to the uPortal community seeking uh, Java-based front-end development capabilities. Uh, all of the pressure that we're getting, uh, you know, whether it is directly stated or, or implied uh, from every direction is pressure to, um, uh, offer better support uh, and better options for 
uh, this style of front end development. So we are over, um, you know, it seems like we still have a lot of connections. If anyone wants to ask more questions, uh, I'm willing to hang on for another 15 minutes or whatever. Allie is probably free to stop the recording. All right, sounds yeah. great. Thanks so much everybody for joining.